What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to an all-new episode of the Pack a Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. My guest is the one and only Sam Monson. You can follow him on Twitter at PFF underscore Sam. Of course, he is PFF's lead NFL analyst and the co-host of the PFF NFL Pod. Sam, welcome back. The last time we spoke was two weeks ago. The Packers were three and six. It looked like they might be getting ready to go three and nine with games coming up against the Chargers, the Lions, and the Chiefs. They do not. They beat the Chargers. They beat the Lions. They're now the five and six Packers with a very interesting game coming up with the Chiefs. First of all, how are you doing? Second of all, what the heck happened? Doing well, yeah. Um, I mean, the Chargers game kind of made some sense, right? The, those are two teams that were in a similar kind of position. But the one that really shocked everybody, I think, was that performance against Detroit on Thanksgiving, where... On the one hand, the Lions went back to being the Lions, right? This is what they do on Thanksgiving. On the other hand, the Packers forced it. I mean, they absolutely dominated Detroit in a game that I don't think many people saw coming at all. It wasn't just, you know, Detroit mistakes, errors, and, and let, like, open the door for Green Bay. You know, the Packers' defense was phenomenal. Jordan Love had the game that everybody's been waiting for in terms of uh, no mistakes, incredible accuracy, incredible playmaking, and they just showed up, and they were – the better team in that game. Like, no ifs or buts. You can't kind of question it. They were better in that game. Now, whether they'll be better going forward or overall, that's up for debate. But they had a fantastic performance and absolutely beat um, a good team. That was my big takeaway in both of those games as well. And I was a little bit of a wet blanket after the, the Chargers game saying, like, yeah, they played well against the Chargers in moments, but the Chargers did everything they could to give that game away with multiple right. drops and just bizarro plays. And it felt like, all right, this is kind of like a, it's a nice win. We'll take it. But the Chargers definitely did their, their helping out in it. And the Lions game, I've said all week, like you go back and look at that in a couple different plays different. It's not a Lions win. It's like a 43 to 14 Packers win um, and even more of a drubbing. I, I, I was really, really impressed with Green Bay. Where, where are you kind of at? And, and as you kind of eloquently mentioned, like we'll see what happens from here. There's a lot of season left for Green Bay. And like, we'll see if they can actually stack this together moving forward. But how do you evaluate this Packers team now sitting at five and six, actually a game better than they were a season ago with Aaron at quarterback and coming off two wins against the Chargers and the Lions? Yeah, I mean, they put themselves in position to go on this kind of run. We've talked a lot this uh, this year about how, look, it's an incredibly young, inexperienced offense in particular, right? And yeah. that's been contributing to all the mistakes they've made and, yeah. and the fact that they've been kind of holding themselves back and shooting themselves in the foot to a degree. But it also has meant that, you know, if there's development to be done in season, uh, this team could get a lot better quite quickly, right? The, the, the group being so young and inexperienced together um, may well, you know, give them a, a higher capacity for in-season improvement than some other teams where, you know, most players are veterans. You don't expect them to get an awful lot better during the course of the season. Like this group could vastly improve its performance overall. And I think the Lions game was like an indication of where they can get to. Like maybe that's not going to be their baseline going forward. But that kind of showed you what this team is capable of if those guys stop making those mistakes, if they do play to something like the the high end of their capacity and their ability and their potential. Um, and I think there have been kind of signs that various players in that offense are moving in the right direction, even if that represented like a big jump forward and, and maybe won't be the where they're going to be every single week. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, I've used the term proof of concept of like where this could head moving forward. I think we saw a little bit of that in this Detroit game of like, all right, if everything's clicking in, I think the impressive thing is how many injuries they had in that game, especially compared to Detroit, which was basically missing like Jonah Jackson. I guess we could go like Chauncey Gardner Johnson from the beginning of the year too, but Detroit much healthier in that game than Green Bay and Green Bay had a, a ton of injuries going in, still found a way to win on a short week. And I think you have to be excited. The other thing too, Green Bay still has yet to get any sort of semblance of a true running game going throughout the course of this year. The fact that they've been able to kind of do some of this stuff on offense with Jordan Love and with a really young core without much of a running game, we'll talk about more on that in just a moment, I think is also impressive. I wanted to ask you, though, you did a great article this week over on PFF.com about the improved play of Jordan Love. Just kind of some of your key takeaways from that article and what you've kind of been witnessing from Jordan as of late. Yeah, I mean, the biggest concern we had or the biggest flaw in his game for the, the first half of the year was that inaccuracy that we talked about a lot, right? Not necessarily completion rate, though that wasn't amazing, but basic ball location has been off 
all season long relative to other other quarterbacks. Um, and even some of the big plays, even some of the completed passes, the ball location wasn't just, you know, off by a foot or two. It was way off and it was causing, you know, limited um, yards after the catch. It was causing passes at the catch point to be more difficult than they needed to be, all these kinds of things. And it was contributing to, I think, some of the mistakes. You know, we we tend to look at drop rate and things like that just in isolated terms and say, well, those are only wide receiver mistakes. But they're not really, right? Drop rates are also impacted by the quarterbacks throwing the ball. Bad quarterbacks tend to have higher drop rates than good quarterbacks because there's something to where the ball ends up being, like how hard is the catch that you're attempting, right? If the ball is behind you and it requires an adjustment before you even get your hands to it, it's you're going to be more prone to dropping it than you are if it's exactly where it's supposed to be, you know, numbers right in your face and you just have to catch the football. So Love's basic inaccuracy with the ball a was was part of his issue in college and b was his biggest problem right now that has been a trending in the right direction in recent weeks and b against the lions was gone i mean his ball location against detroit was insane um there was almost no inaccurate passes whatsoever and actually an absurd rate of not just accurate but like perfectly accurate ball location the the like he went from one end of the spectrum to the other um he eradicated the misses and was was absolutely perfectly placing so many of these passes. And, you know, if he's able to make adjustments to that part of his game, I mean, you're, you're immediately making inroads on your biggest weakness. And that's, I think, a huge thing of, of quarterback play. A lot of the, you know, quarterbacks in the NFL, they each have different flaws, what their biggest weakness is. Sam Howell is a sack magnet, right? And he's improved that part of his game over the course of this year. Jordan Love's problem is ball location. Like If he fixes that, he, again, even if, Detroit doesn't represent where he's going to get to if that's just showing where he could be. You know, if he gets halfway between the two, he's made a massive difference in terms of what he can do and what the offense can do. So, you know, Love is in a difficult situation um, because of the whole, what is the start of his career look like because of the contract they gave him. He's on a fast, accelerated timetable, right? They, they don't have two or three years to figure out what he's going to look like. You basically need to see it all within this one season. So any steps in the right direction, I think, are huge for him and his ability to sort of sell the team on what he can be going forward. It's funny. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned something where I said, if, if I had to guess through the remainder of the season, we're going to get one insanely good Jordan Love game at least. And we're probably still yet to have that one, like just really bad, like, you know, three, four, or like something awful, like for a really bad game from him. I said, we're probably going to see one of those yet. And the reason I felt confident, at least in that first part of having a really uh, incredible game was there'd be times in training camps over the course of the past few seasons where he would just get on one and it would just look like unbelievable. And he would be completing to everyone in rhythm on time. Like there was one practice a couple of years ago where like he was doing the belt and like he was doing everything. He was just on fire. And like, he has this ability. It's almost like a, a rhythm shooter in basketball where you see that first one go through the hoop and then the second and the third and it's just good night nurse. It's, it's game over from there. And I, we saw that a little bit from Jordan where he got into a rhythm early and he continued it throughout the course of the game. Now, the big thing for Jordan, and I think everyone knows this, is now can you do that week after week? And not maybe to that perfect level, but with any level of consistency. And as you mentioned, kind of continue that progress that he's made over the past month as a more accurate passer. If so, a lot of those questions are answered. And he very quickly, I think, becomes the guy in Green Bay and is trending in the right direction to do so. Uh, but we'll see if he also has that negative one where he can't get in that rhythm and maybe throws a few picks in the process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I that was such an encouraging game for him because I think that was the player. He, but even before that game, I think there was a question mark about what he could be, you know, because we've seen a, a couple of plays here or there that we knew he had that kind of high end ability. But this sort of showed you that forget like flashy big time throws, all that kind of stuff. Like he can just put the ball pinpoint accurately where it needs to be consistently and make a ton of plays over the course of one game without necessarily being incredibly flashy like it just represented a very attainable but yeah. equally impressive um ceiling of how good he could be yeah it should be fun this week at another really good challenge really great challenge against the chiefs steve spagnolo who gave Jordan Love specifically a lot of trouble a couple of years ago in his first ever start so that should be another great test for jordan Meanwhile, the Packers out of nowhere, five and six, are 
not only like sneaky playoff contenders, most betting sites at least have them as a, a coin flip. If not a little bit ahead is like a 51, 52% chance to make the playoffs. They've got this really difficult game coming up against the Chiefs. And then five rather winnable games after that. You have the Giants on the road. You've got Tampa Bay at home, Panthers on the road, followed by the Vikings on the road, and then the Bears at home to end the season. Those are five winnable games for a lot of teams, much less a team that's winning three of their last four. How do you view Green Bay as a all of a sudden unlikely playoff contender? Yeah, I mean, I think they put themselves back into that conversation and kind of almost drawn level with the Vikings, right? The Vikings had put themselves in a spot to have a, an amazing chance of making the playoffs, and then they've dropped a couple of games that they could and should have been winning um, in the last few weeks, and now their their position has become precarious. But at the same time, like Green Bay has essentially replaced them or at least drawn level with them by winning their games that they weren't necessarily expected to win or having the kind of performances that they were supposed to have. So I think both teams have a pretty good shot. That seventh spot in particular in the NFC as a wild card spot is going to be, you know, I, I don't think you're going to have to have a tremendously good record to have that seventh wild card spot. So anybody effectively that goes on a run could easily get that spot. And the division isn't gone yet. You know, Detroit losing that game. Like, that's not out of sight. The Vikings played Detroit twice. And as much as they've lost a couple of games recently, they could win either or both of those the way the, the Minnesota Vikings are, particularly when they get Justin Jefferson back. You know, Minnesota, ironically, could help Green Bay. Uh, and, and suddenly that division becomes like a three-horse race by the end of it. It would be very, very interesting. And certainly if, if Detroit does go on like a little bit of a spiral or suffers an injury at a wrong position or something, they, you could easily see them, you know, kind of rolling back to the pack and I like I'm so intrigued. You know, the rest of the season, of course, you get that number seven seed, and the reward is either going to be the 49ers or Eagles on the road, which is not exactly a, an amazing prize. But still, for a young team like Green Bay, just to get that playoff experience, even if they have to roll into one of those spots and you know get the get the L, it is still I think valuable for for the team. You brought up an interesting point on uh, the PFF pod, or at least you and Steve both did. It sounds like maybe you'd mentioned it to him off the air of the Christian Watson post Thanksgiving run. We saw it last year in his rookie year and it was incredible. And then this year just he had the injury again to start the year, started off like almost like in reverse, not even neutral, just kind of going backwards. And then as of late, you started to see it pick up. And then against the Lions, you get the big catch early, a contested catch here and there. Like just looked totally different at the touchdown a couple weeks ago in the back of the end zone against the Chargers. Are, are we getting the, the post-Thanksgiving Christian Watson run? Is this going to become a real thing for him? Yeah, maybe. We had a listener a couple uh, years ago um, mention to us that like Brian Hoyer was only good before Thanksgiving. And then as soon as Thanksgiving hit, Brian Hoyer would turn back into a pumpkin and you would never get good games again. Um, yeah, Christian Watson so far, I mean, it took until reasonably late last season for him to break out. And then he went on that incredible run of touchdowns and, and looked like one of the best receivers, rookie receivers in the NFL heading into year two. And it just none of that was the case heading into this season. And then Thanksgiving hits and you have that incredible game. Like, again, that was the game they've been trying to get going for Christian Watson all the way through the season. Um, and you suddenly get it in that Lions game where everything seemed to work on, on both sides of the ball. So. Yeah, like uh, hopefully from his perspective and from the Packers' perspective, that's it. That's the the spark that's going to recapture what he had late last year and and create that kind of run again. Because clearly he has, you know, the physical, the 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 size, the speed, the athleticism, like that stuff plays. And then he just needs to string together what he's been able to do in his best games. It would certainly be a huge positive for Green Bay if he did you know, and was capable of having another stretch like he had right around this time a season ago because uh, he looked like, uh, you know, he just had a major breakout at the end of last year. If he can do that again, that'd be massive. I do want to add, like, we're a long ways away, I guess, mostly in the NFL. We can always talk draft in some capacity, but we're a long ways away from the draft. There's a lot of top wide receivers, it looks like, that are going to be in that draft. I'm curious just your thoughts in general on the Packers wide receiver room now that we've seen a few more of these guys Watson and Dobbs in their second year. Dontavian Wicks is separating at a really impressive level for a, especially for a, a fifth round rookie. Jaden Reed is coming up with some explosive plays week after week after week. Even Malik Heath this week has a really impressive game. If you're Green Bay, are you comfortable with that five wide receiver group the way that it is right now and them being still young and, and developing? Or if, if you're Green Bay, are you still being like, you know, if there's a, if there's the right receiver there in the first round, they should still be very active in looking in that direction. 
I think it kind of depends whether we get this Christian Watson run that we just talked about. If he does go back to what he was towards the tail end of last season and go on a run and look like that guy again, then I think you can kind of you can talk yourself into going out of the season and say, we're pretty set. They're all very young, but we've seen enough out of all these guys to be comfortable. You know, maybe I wouldn't then rush to draft a receiver in the first round. I wouldn't keep it or wouldn't have it prevent me drafting one at all. You know, if a guy you like yeah. is in the second, third, wherever, then sure. But I, I wouldn't see it as a glaring need. If we don't get that from Watson, you know, if that was an isolated incident or we get two games, three games, whatever, but we still have questions about what he's going to be going forward, then I think you you do want to find some kind of solution to that, like the number one guy, because yeah. I think all the other players that they have, whether it's Jaden Reed, Romeo Dobbs, um, you know, Dontavian Wicks, any of these other guys, I think they're really useful um, complementary pieces. I think they're useful parts of a, of a receiving core, but the kind that get like exponentially enhanced by finding that number one guy, kind of the way when you put Jamar Chase on the Bengals, right? All of a sudden that looks like the best wide receiver room in the NFL. When you take him off, it's like, ah, we could really use a number one guy, right? It's not the same yeah. thing. Um, I think a number one, a true number one receiver makes the same difference to the Packers. And maybe that is Christian Watson. And it's just been a little bit of a bumpy road for him to get there. But if he isn't able to show that for the rest of the year, I think they still need to try and find that guy. Yeah, having that number one true playmaking option is still super important. I still think Green Bay is going to go into the draft next year one way or the other, very much with the best player available mentality. And if that ends up being a wide receiver, so be it. You figure out the rest later. But I'm really intrigued by this group of wide receivers and what they can kind of become long term. But to your point, Christian Watson, a huge wild card in that. And if he hits the top end, you're probably set. And if he doesn't, if he kind of bottoms out and it's just like this is what Christian Watson is, then you're probably left wanting just a little bit more. Uh, let's jump over to the defensive side of the ball. A player that I think is starting to catch some eyes is defensive lineman Carl Brooks, who has had some really impressive plays, but this week might have been his best week. 91.5 grade per PFF against the Lions. What have you been seeing from Carl Brooks and what can he kind of bring to this team, not only right now, but maybe moving forward as well? Yeah, I think he's a really solid defensive lineman. Um, he, you know, he made some good plays as a kind of a lot of modest wins as a pass rusher. Wasn't necessarily anything incredibly decisive in there. Some solid plays against the run as well. And then he had that forced fumble on Jared Goff that was what sort of spiked his grade up to 90 plus um, given, given the sort of playing time that he had in that game. I love Carl Brooks at draft time. I still think yeah. he might be miscast in terms of He's got an interior defensive lineman's body, but I think his best traits, or not his best traits, his best um, sort of techniques are actually edge rusher techniques. He's a weird 300-pound edge rusher, and yep. the NFL doesn't like that, so they make him an interior guy where I think he's going to be quite good, but I do sort of feel that he would be better if you just let him do what he does best and play him on the edge. But, you know, we're not going to – I don't think we're going to see that, but – he's making a good living for himself right now, showing that it does translate to the interior and he can be a productive player, um, you know, on the inside, even if maybe it isn't the thing that he does absolutely best in the world. It's it's funny because I'd actually like to see LVN get a little bit more time on the interior of the defensive line as a pass rusher. And I'd actually like to see Carl Brooks get a little bit more time on, as an edge player, especially even in like the run game. Like they're, it's at times setting the edge has been a little bit of a chore for this team. And like, hey, maybe try the 300 pound guy that played some edge in college and see if he can maybe set the edge too. It'd just be intriguing. I'm, I'm surprised that they haven't at least experimented with either of those a little bit more. We're starting to get a little trickling of LVN on the interior. Um, it has nothing for LVN has really clicked as of yet. You can see all the athleticism, but as a player, it hasn't clicked. Um, Carl Brooks, we've seen some of that where like all of a sudden it is clicking and it's really, really fun. But I, I think Green Bay is taking the idea of like, let's have Carl Brooks learn everything on the interior first, and then yeah. we'll expand from there. And same thing with LVN on the outside. Let's have him learn everything on the outside and expand from there. But I do wish they'd maybe try a few different things with those guys. Yeah, and that makes sense, right? There, there's a balance to be had there between getting the guy up to speed and comfortable and just developing and, and learning what his role is in the NFL and trying to sort of tr figure out where he should be the best. And I, I said this at draft time. I think that they drafted an interior player that they're going to play on the edge, and then they drafted an edge rusher that they're going to play on the interior. And That's ironically, true. I think they'd be better if they swapped them over. I, I honestly think that um, Van Ness is that kind of interior player and should be going forward. I think that's where his strengths lie. 
And I think Carl Brooks is just a miscast edge rusher. Like they, I understand why you don't play him there, but he reminded me a bit of Charles Grant. Um, if anyone yeah. remembers him back in the day for the Saints, Charles yeah. Grant was like a 290 pound 4 3 defensive end. It didn't make any sense. It's not supposed to happen. Those guys are not supposed to play at that position, but he did, and he was good at it. Um, and I think that was Carl Brooks, like a, a not particularly athletic 300 pound edge rusher who was able to make it work. Um, but teams don't like that kind of you know this is this doesn't fit the cookie cutter mold that i'm expecting so we're going to plug him to where he does fit and let's make it work there but yeah I, I i agree with you and i hope you're right that once they both get comfortable with you know knowing their roles that in this day and age of players you know moving around defensive lines we will see more of that from both guys and maybe that will self-select right if 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 it turns out carl brooks does in fact do a lot better on the edge then you know, let's move them out there most of the time. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Green Bay had a Mike Neal as well, former second round pick who they started on the interior and then experiments a little bit with on the outside when he didn't really click as well on the interior. So we'll see if maybe they get to that or maybe he just clicks as an interior guy and goes from there. But he's a really interesting player and I'm excited to see him play well and hopefully that can continue moving forward. A couple more that I want to get you out of here. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued as to what your thoughts on this Packers offensive line. I think some of the... Um, even like the announcers have started to catch up to this as well. I think maybe Greg Olson mentioned it this past week, but um, this offensive line is so interesting in the fact that their pass pro grades are actually pretty darn good. Their run blocking grades are beyond all outside of Zach Tom. I think Zach Tom's the only one that has a slightly better uh, run blocking grade from you guys than a pass protection grade, but um, pass pro pretty darn good, but run blocking absolutely brutal. Like how have you seen an offensive line that's been like specifically so hot in one area and cold in the other? Yeah, last year's Jags were like this. The last year's Jags ranked in the top, I forget what, how high they were, but like definitely top 10, maybe top five in terms of pass blocking grades. But they were literally the worst run blocking offensive line in the NFL by PFF grade. They were as one-sided as it gets. And there have been quite a few in recent years. It's actually, I think, a, I don't know if it's always been this way or and we're just noticing it now and it's it's now sure. like selection bias, you know? Or if it's if this is a new trait in the NFL, that there are certain lines that are skewing radically in one direction or the other when it comes to run blocking or pass protection. Because there are some lines that go the other way as well that are, are yeah. really good run blockers and, and not good pass protection at all. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's definitely unusual, but it's becoming more and more common, I think. Um, and there are lines that are like that. And I guess if you want, if you're going to have one or the other, you're going to want the pass protectors at the moment. Certainly when you've got a young quarterback and a young group of receivers, like, you know, let's, let's make sure pass protection is set. And if that means that the run game is going to be suspect or, or not the thing to lean on, then so be it. I think that's probably better than having, you know, a dominant run blocking offensive line, but one that you can't really trust to drop back and pass protect when you need to. It's interesting. I'm wondering if there's almost like a, all right, it, it's so hard to find well-rounded offensive linemen altogether, like really good offensive linemen that are good in pass pro, good in run blocking are insanely hard to find. So I'm wondering if like, I don't know, maybe it's a Goody thing and some of these GMs are just like, hey, let's just, if, if we can't find the best of both worlds and we know that's going to be insanely hard to do without putting just a ton of capital into it, let's go get some really good pass protectors and then we'll figure out the run game stuff as we go and try to teach them to be better run blockers. Like that's not the worst idea in the world if that's the direction that they head in. But it, like you said, it does sound like there's more and more of this throughout the league and with, with having it be so hard to find and like just look in New York at how awful some offensive lines can be. Um, maybe they're just trying to live a half life and be like, let's be good at one of them at least. Yeah, it's possible. But I think sometimes when you see these lines that trend in that direction for a few years, um, there are players that come in to that offensive line from a, you know, from a different offense, from a different system somewhere else. And they go from being like one to the other. They go from being good at run blocking to suddenly they're great and great at pass protection and not at run blocking. So I don't think it's necessarily that they're searching for a specific style of lineman, but I think it might be something there, you know, there might be a coaching element to it, which is this is what we're going to focus on. This is what you're going to dedicate your time to. This is what you're going to um, really, you know, dial in on and and kind of forget the rest, right? And we'll we'll deal with that down the road, or or we'll live with that being a weaker area. So I don't think it, I don't think it's necessarily a personnel acquisition thing, but I think there is definitely an element of coaching somewhere involved in the, in it. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. All right. 
this one I'm sure we could probably spend 30 minutes on in and of itself, but just kind of <laughs> wanted to get your thousand foot view now that we're a little bit more through the season. We're coming off Jordan's best game. We just find out that Aaron Rodgers practice window is open, whatever that means. I still have a hard time believing he's going to come back this season based on where the Jets are at. And this entire equation is super clouded by the fact that, of course, Aaron tears his Achilles in the very first you know, drive of the very first game, but a little bit separated from it. We're seeing Jordan Love now as the starter for Green Bay. They get off some of that salary. They, they're able to move up in the first round of the draft, which may or may not have been a good thing. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, they get a second round pick that they turn into some really impressive stuff. They get a second round pick next year. The Jets, meanwhile, they get Aaron. It doesn't go well with the injury, but also they have a lot of stuff that comes with it, including maybe Nathaniel Hackett, Alan Lazard, um, Randall Cobb. Some of the things that on the like side of it are not going great at the moment, but just kind of thousand foot view. How are you viewing this Packers Jets trade as of right now? Yeah, I mean, I think Green Bay won the trade at the time. Um, I think you know it was a strange. They played chicken, right? Like the the point where it was such a, a weird deal because Rogers had sort of come out and publicly said he wants to play for the Jets, and at that point nobody has any leverage because yeah. everyone knows it has to happen. Rogers wants out. The Jets need him desperately. And the Packers need to get rid of him because he's already said he wants out. And you can't, like, you know, try and get the deal done, then then announce to him, hey, sorry, Aaron, you're stuck here for another year. So nobody had any leverage, but the Jets were the team that blinked first and apparently blinked hard because the trade that they ended up giving up, I thought, was massive relative to expectations or, or to what they maybe could have gotten him for if they'd been more patient or more willing to play hardball or, you know, simply hadn't been the team that, that blinked first um so i think they won it at the time and the way it's panned out it only looks better from their perspective even if the the pick isn't being upgraded because of his injury you know just it hasn't gone well for the jets because they didn't get any of the benefit they got all of the negative you know what they gave up all the, the sort of extra pieces that they brought in like the gm rogers aspect of it and then got none of the reward because rogers went down immediately and they had to turn to zach wilson the whole thing has been a disaster so, you know, from the Jets' perspective, it's all been bad, but Green Bay gets a trade that already looked good, and they don't get any of the negative. The only way it would have looked bad for Green Bay is if Rodgers had looked like an MVP and, you know, been the best player in the NFL, and then maybe you've got some kind of buyer's remorse or seller's yeah. remorse where you're like, man, we should have kept hold of him, you know, one more year or whatever. They don't get any of that. They get to <laughs> completely just pretend like that's not even a possibility. This was only ever going to go well for us. And, you know, it, it's it's nothing but positivity from the, the, the Packers' perspective. Yeah, maybe really interested to see what happens with the Jets in 2024 and just kind of how many of those pieces stay together. It sounds like they're going to try to run it back one more time, but that's all going to be very interesting. The biggest losers, I think, are just the fans of the NFL, obviously the Jets too, because I think we all wanted to see Aaron play for the Jets in some capacity, see how it could have gone. I think it would have been a really interesting variable too to just to evaluate. All right, how does Aaron and Lazard and Cobb and those guys look in New York? And did Green Bay was was it like better in Green Bay than it was in New York? Was it better in New York than it was in Green Bay? And why? Like I think Green Bay lost a little bit of an evaluation point there too, but. Either way, it's a bummer that it happened, and hopefully it can still be a good trade for both teams and the Jets can be better in 2024 with Aaron at QB. Sam, you are absolutely amazing. Tell all the awesome people out there where they can find your work and tell them about the PFF NFL pod. Yeah, PFF NFL podcast is where we are five days a week. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts or on uh, YouTube, and there is an absolute ton of minutes out there. The, the Spotify wraps are coming out this week, and the number of minutes that we've put out there over the last year is actually quite terrifying uh, there's people apparently that listen to all of them so you know <laughs> become one of those people yeah not surprising at all they do absolutely amazing work and uh, make sure to check out sam's article on jordan love as well over on pff.com really well done again you can follow him at sam underscore or pff underscore sam excuse me you can follow me at andy herman nfl you can follow the podcast at packaday podcast for sam i'm andy until next time and as always go pack go